a great pleasure uh, to have you here, but even more so to have three of the most uh, exciting and unusual combination of curators with me on this panel today. Um, first, there's Shona Gatta, <coughs> who is no stranger to Lahore. She has been here more than once. And uh, the background is she's an art historian. She's a museum curator, has worked at the British Museum and the Peabody Museum in the US. Um, Shona's interest and focus has been South Asia. And both uh, engaged with the British Museum grand collections amassed during colonial times and added to later. She has been an interpreter of that collection uh, and I think has done it very successfully for audiences specifically in Britain and specifically for the diaspora. Although, of course, her blockbuster show, which was really on the Bengal <coughs> voice, uh, was something that was not restricted to people um, from the diaspora, but was a revelation and one of the best attended exhibitions ever uh, was at the British Museum. Uh, I'm sure her move to the US to a museum which had a strong collection from South Asia, modern contemporary art, but had never really brought it to the attention of audiences there, that must have been quite a move for her. And I'd like you to talk about that later. Uh, <coughs> we have <coughs> Melissa Chu next to her, who has been in Lahore also before. <coughs> My own association with her goes back to the time when I worked with her at the show of Pakistani Contemporary Art, Hanging Fire, when she was at the Asia Society Museum in New York. And it was a very strong and, for me at least, a very valuable partnership that I had with Melissa, who has now moved uh, to Washington, D.C. She is the director of the Smithsonian Hershon uh, Museum of, you know, which is a contemporary art museum and modern art museum and the Sculpture Garden. And that has been, I think, quite a transformation in her practice as a curator, but also I think a great transformation for that museum. Um, the Hershon was known for its strong collection of um, post-World War art, uh, his European and American collection. And for Melissa, whose own focus has been on the Far East, specifically China, uh, for her to take on this uh, task of, I think, widening um, the audiences and of bringing Asia to Washington, D.C in a manner I think that had not happened before and had, has raised not just audiences, she has had the task of widening the donor base and I'm told that was successful in two very major multi-million dollar donations, probably the largest that that museum had ever had. Um, we'll hear more about the challenges of working in what I always think of it as a, a rather fuddy daddy place, which is Washington. Though she says, I don't meet those people, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, there is Wally, whose uh, uh, PowerPoint is still downloading. Uh, oh, it's been done, that's great. Who works with a collection which he invents. And I say that because um, he runs a, a curatorial platform, which is quite unusual, but I think highly relevant for our times. Um, he calls it the archaeology of the final decade. And it's, it deals with something that we in Pakistan 
are quite familiar with, deals with disappearances. It deals with disappearances of cultural moments, of cultural artifacts, of cultural erasure. And he goes into, I should mention that he is of Iranian origin but lives in London. And his exhibitions have dealt with some of these moments in our near history which have resonances with ancient history also and how he resurrects them and makes them pertinent and really makes us dwell on the purpose of curatorial work. I especially mention that these individuals who all have art history backgrounds um, have specifically tried through their practice, through their curatorial practice, to bring to their audience new awarenesses. And for us in Pakistan where curatorship is really a very new idea, a new concept, which has yet to, um, to find a profile which is representative of all that is possible. Uh, with both our collections in public areas and in private spheres to make us aware of what the curator does and how they interpret what is there for the audience and to what purpose. And I'd like each one of my panelists today to really talk about how their own practice as a curator has taken on uh, collections or in Wally's case an absence of collections and has brought new meaning to the way that we engage with our worlds today um, and how we deal with the visual and beyond. So Shona first I'd like to talk to you because I think probably what you have been dealing with is most familiar to us which is South Asia. South Asia and a lot of people have seen you on your BBC uh, programs that we have uh, watched to do with um, this part of the world. I'd like you to talk about your experiences in the British Museum and then in the US and what your wider objectives were and what do you think that the curator does? What is their role? Why do we need them with you know co collections which are very old, which everybody should be familiar with? Well, thanks, Anima. It's really wonderful to be here back in this great city again. Um, and uh, is it working? Can you hear me? Yes. It's really wonderful to be back in this great city again, so I'm really delighted to be here. And thank you to me for hosting this event. Um, so, I. Okay, now it's done. Is that better? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so I started my working life at the British Museum. Um, it's the place, in a sense, where I cut my curatorial teeth. And it was a good place to start. Um, it's probably the biggest collection of South Asian art in any museum outside India, both in terms of its volume and also in terms of its chronological range and also in terms of the variety of materials. So everything from um, high courtly art to folk art right up to contemporary. So it was a really good um, learning experience to find myself in the bowels of this great museum. Um, but I have to say, when I joined the museum in 2005, um, I was the first person of Asian extraction to work at curatorial level in the Asia department, um, which is really quite shocking. Um, and I don't know if it matters. Um, I like to think that perhaps it does. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well um, today. But um, how do we continue to make collections relevant and meaningful? Um, because if you don't stage them, they don't matter. If people don't see them, if they don't understand them, um, then they fall into disrepair. 
And really the best museums for me are places where objects are interpreted and reinterpreted and stories and new stories are told um, from one generation to the next. Um, so there, are, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that they're not, often we see museums, particularly in South Asia and, and in India, where there is a real wealth of collections, but curation, again, is a very nascent field. Um, museums are seen as dusty, boring, dry places. Um, and I suppose my approach has been to try and show that they need to be dynamic and really to release objects from the vitrine, if you like. Um, and the first project I worked on at the British Museum, um, The Voices of Bengal Season, in 2006, um, I tried to do two things that I hope were different. The first thing is that we made an installation out of a living tradition. So rather than taking historical classical art, putting it um, um, in cases, labelling it, and having didactive um, panels, um, as is the standard procedure, which is a very passive um, type of engaged museum engagement. What I wanted to do was create an immersive space. So we took the museum's Great Court, which is actually a public thoroughfare, and we used that as the exhibition space. We brought master craftsmen from India, and they created in situ in the Great Court over six weeks a 20-foot high image of the goddess Durga in preparation for a major Hindu festival. And people became part of that creative process and they became engaged with it. And the other thing that we did is that we um, invited members of the community, the Bengali community, to be our project partners. And that was a very radical proposition for the museum. Um, and, you know, it had its problems. But what it meant is that suddenly a community felt that they were, became stakeholders in the institution. And I think particularly given the narrative of um, empire and the way a lot of these collections were acquired and ended up at the BM, um, it was important to try and change the process of working with these collections. So that's what I tried to do by having a completely different type of working model and giving people a sense of ownership. So it wasn't the museum telling them about their culture. They were coming in and partaking in that um, creative process and creative enterprise. And as Salima said, it did actually attract more people of South Asian extraction than any project in the British Museum's history. And I'm sure that um, some of these different approaches had something to do with that. Um, I, in 2012, I left the British Museum, um, having learned one or two things, and I went um, to work in America, um, where I was head of South Asian art at the Peabody Essex Museum, which is also a very interesting institution, but very different to the BM. It's not full of, um, it's not a museum of high or courtly art, it's a museum of the vernacular. Um, and it's the oldest continuously running museum in America from the 1790s, which in this part of the world is not old at all, but in America that's really old. And there was a group of sea captains called the East India Marine Association. And to join this group, you had to have sailed around two of the capes. Now, this was a time when to go to Boston, 10 miles away, once in your life was an event. So just imagine the sense of adventure from these group of individuals, and they went out, and it's the port from which America had its first contacts with India and China. So collections have been coming into that collection from those parts of the world since the late 18th century. Um, and the last big acquisition was the Hurwitz collection of modern Indian art, which is the biggest collection of post-47 South Asian art in any museum in Europe or North America, which is why I crossed the Atlantic. Um, to work with that collection. But <clears throat> the challenge I faced was that, firstly, America doesn't have a long-standing relationship with South Asia like Britain does, so there wasn't an obvious connection. So why should Americans care? Um, and when we came to look, um, <clears throat> to prepare um, exhibitions and programming for the 70th anniversary of independence and partition, 
in 2017, um, my director asked me, you know, why, why do people care about partition and independence? And I said, well, let's think about that. Um, the biggest migration of people in human history, religion becomes a matter of life and death, um, new border borders, um, issues of nationhood. These are universal themes which, if you look at it, are germane as much today, if not more, than they were 70 years ago. Um, <clears throat> so it was a question of finding the right kind of framework um, to present this collection, which is nearly 2,000 works of modern, mainly Indian art. Um, and what I wanted to do, that given we had this incredible collection of modern Indian art, was to um, now engage with the best contemporary art that references all of South Asia. <clears throat> and at the British Museum, I had started collecting contemporary art in <coughs> Pakistan, particularly Lahore, and um, acquiring the work of people who trained in the miniature tradition and were creating contemporary miniatures. And so I brought some of that to the Peabody Essex Museum. And um, we um, defined a strategy for engaging, really, with the best contemporary art that references all of South Asia. So not necessarily South Asian artists or Pakistani artists, Indian artists, but work that references the region. So that could be artists from the diaspora, it could be artists um, who happen to travel in the region, or artists from the region. Um, so expanding the remit um, and giving people a new level of uh, engagement. Um, the, the challenge of working in a, an institution like Penn, the Peabody Essex Museum, was that it's not in a big metropolitan area like London. At the British Museum, I knew, even if I didn't do a good job, seven million people were gonna come through the door. Um, today, the Peabody Essex Museum sits in a town of 40,000 people in a suburb of Boston. Um, so I had to find ways to take the collection out into the world. If it's a collection of global importance, um, where are the communities that are going to respond to this. I mean, my predecessor put on a magnificent exhibition of the Hurwitz collection, Midnight to the Boom, painting in India, um, 1947 to 1990. And I was working at the British Museum at the time and the exhibition package came to us and she told me later that they couldn't find a single institution either in America or in Europe to take that show. And this was in 2013. Um, which shows you that while there is great currency for historic South Asian art, we have a long way to go for modern and contemporary. And, you know, one of my colleagues said to me at Penn, well, if it doesn't look Indian, I don't know what to do with it. And I didn't quite realize how racist such a statement is and how deeply problematic it is. Um, and I suppose... Once I start, started working at Penn, my mission came to really challenge the grand narrative of modernism that sits at the High Temple of MoMA and show that there were multiple paths to modernity um, from across Asia um, and elsewhere in the world and find ways to build the knowledge base for that, which is one of the reasons why I chose to do broadcast work, because you reach a whole new demographic of people. People who would never think to go to a museum, <coughs> suddenly you arrive into their living room um, and enable them to engage with a subject that perhaps they otherwise wouldn't. Um, so I think I'll stop there for the moment and pass on to Melissa. Well, Melissa, you've sort of been the shows that you have recently done, um, and in fact the, the, the additions that you've made to the collection, um, which have attempted to kind of move out of Europe and the US, I think they have been very high profile. Just, I'd just like to, you to talk about what the greatest challenges were when you decided to you know, move into Washington and to, you were given this I think quite high profile job, um, you know, coming from New York, which is a different cup of tea entirely. I mean, what, what was the first thoughts that came to you? Okay, I've got this place. What am I going to do here? You know, at the Hershon. Yeah, so, so I'll, 
I, I will address that. I think um, one of your earlier questions was about curatorial panels, yeah, so I yeah. thought I would just reflect on that for a moment, because yes. my experience yeah, is yeah, quite different yeah. from others perhaps on the panel, in that, yes, right now I am director of a Smithsonian institution, the National yeah. Museum of Modern Art, but actually um, I started out as a curator in Sydney, Australia, um, wanting to work with artists, and so we founded an artist-run space that was really all about brokering a relationship between Australian and Asian Australian and Asian artists. And it was that kind of trifecta relationship that I think hadn't been forged before in Australia. Because so much of the discussion at that time, and if we turn our um, eyes back to the early 1990s, when the Asia Pacific Triangle was just starting to get going, and we had very much a strong regional dialogue just in formation here in the Asia Pacific region. It was always kind of brokered by a bilateral relationship. It was always Australia, Pakistan, Australia, Japan. It was, and it was kind of almost a geopolitical response of a changing um, kind of political and economic environment. And so I was very interested in trying to see how you could build a different sort of community in Sydney. We got a building in Chinatown, um, we built the organisation, it's still going, it's known as um, the Asia Australia Art Centre. And so I always feel like um, that for me was a very important uh, background. You know, we gave uh, Shilpa Gupta her first show, it was the first time she went overseas, her mother had packed her masala. <laughs> It was a lot of, um, you know, we ran a residency program, and so from that experience, I learned a lot about how to, on the one hand, speak to a, a local community, but also have a larger regional or international conversation. And so I feel like when I um, got my job in New York, which was the first curator of Asian and Asian American contemporary art in that country. Um, I had already felt like I had worked in the region and was very much a part of it. And so when I went to New York, I learned that actually it was a very different kind of conversation that needed to happen. So when I think of curatorial practice, it's actually much more about the institutional imperative as much as your own desire as a curator. In a way, I found that my work as a curator is a response to the institutional mission and trying to find your place within that mission. And so with Asia Society, we did actually two exhibitions here in Pakistan under my tenure, which was the Hanging Fire exhibition that Salima did, but also a Gandharan exhibition. And I'm very proud of both shows because they were both very difficult shows to organize. And I was interested in, um, when I was at Asia Society, that um, American perception of the region what is it that Americans kind of knew already about the region and how could you build on that in a much more um, kind of complex way? And so for Hanging Fire, it was really all about the fact that most people were really scared of Pakistan. They were scared of coming here. They had no idea that there was even a contemporary art scene. And so that was very much an introductory exhibition. Just as the Gandharan show, which was put on right at the time of the Osama bin Laden assassination and at an all-time low in the US-Pakistan political relationship, it was a very important moment because it gave Americans an understanding of another type of history here in Pakistan that was Buddhist, that was very different from uh, the headlines at the time. And so I feel like, you know, that, that um, that was very much about the mission of the Asia Society. And now if I think of my work at the Herschel, I stepped into an institution that was always international in its remit. However, 40 years ago, international really meant European, American, and a little bit of Latin American. <laughs> so now we are in the 21st century, and um, one of the things that I was very interested in was thinking about the 20th century, not just the 21st century, but the 20th century in a different kind of way. That yes, we have extraordinary masterworks. We have 30 Giacometti, seven Francis Bacon, the largest holdings of David Smith and Henry Moore and things like that. 
because our founder, Mr. Hirschhorn, was very interested in sculpture and European and American art. However, now, if we think about the opportunity for museums and for curators in museums, I think it's really about, in some ways, kind of correcting the course of art history, meaning how can we think about not just the art centres of London, New York, Paris in the 20th century? Can we think of multiple centres and artists working in very different ways, sometimes similar, sometimes at the same time, sometimes at different times? So one example of our approach is to they look at two artists. We're developing an exhibition right now of um, Kishio Suga's work, who was one of the major artists of the Monoha movement in Japan, and uh, Giuseppe Pinone, who was one of the uh, foremost figures of Arte Povera in Italy. And these were two movements that were going on at the same time, one in Italy and one in Japan. Not necessarily the same imperatives nor mission, but with very similar aesthetic styles and attention to materials. And so through that exhibition, we're hoping to draw some um, parallels and argue from, for a kind of international synchronicity at that very moment in time. And I think in some ways, this is what the work of a curator at a museum can do, which is set a new kind of course for art history through exhibition making because it's exhibition making that drives new scholarship sometimes, sometimes in fact before the academy. You know, I mean, I think the academy, at least in the United States, is very highly defined in terms of specialization, and sometimes it can be hard to step outside of those, um, those areas of expertise. So we're interested in kind of thinking about the 20th century and then also a 21st century that is very much a, a, a global moment when new technology can facilitate new kinds of art production. So they're the kind of two spectrums of which we're looking at. Well, the elusive, well, very elusive because you don't know how to put your finger on exactly what it is that he engages with because he's always in the process of excavation. Mm -hmm. And it is that, I presume the objective is very much the here and now and how we arrived here and what we missed out on and where are the gaps. Um, so, Willie, yes. Yes. What uh, is your imperative? Thank you, Sammy. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's true that um, the work that I do is, is elusive, but that's partly because, as Salima said, I'm dealing with disappearances. So, um, I actually put a little of our PowerPoint together because I thought it would be easier to quickly take you through some, some images and things. But um, let me just tell you a little bit about the dramatic title, The um, Archaeology of the Final Decade. Uh, it basically means that I deal with um, art and artifact and cultural material that have remained dark and obscure, removed, sometimes banned, destroyed, obliterated, hence the vacuum. Uh, I, in looking at the blind spots of history, the episodes uh, that remain dark in art, in history, and memory, I really focus on the mechanisms that work around it. How I, artifacts are stigmatized, mythologized, condemned to amnesia. Let me um, go through, yeah. So I set up a, a, a curatorial platform and an educational <laughs> research center, which is called this Archaeology of the Final Decade, in 2010. And we work through exhibitions, publications, events, symposia, and I've also had some relationships with institutions. I quite like this, uh, I think this is a very nice panel because I am a non-institutional person, really. But working sub-institutionally is quite interesting because some of the work that I'm doing is becoming interesting to to institutions because, as for example, Melissa said, institutions are expanding their remit, looking into other geographies, and as, as, as um, uh, we know, they are also looking at other modernities. So the work that I am recovering, the gaps in art history that I'm hoping to fill, also do match at the moment uh, interests in institutions, in major institutions. And being from Iran, I have quite a lot to recover and quite a lot to work through. 
I would assume that there are parallels here. I was just at the Dhaka Art Summit. It rang really strong and the resonance was very powerful with what I was doing, also because I discovered through my work that a lot of, what, uh, a lot of the history that's been erased around the projects I'm working on, Iranian base, have actual links to South Asia. In fact, very, very strong links to South Asia. So it resonated very, very strongly in Dhaka. And um, let me take you to one of the projects, which is the material I've excavated and recovered from a festival of performance that happened between 1967 and 1977. I hope, I'm on a panel tomorrow, I hope that I will speak much more in depth about these projects. It is meant to have a film, but I'm not sure how to do it because the, the computer is over there. It doesn't matter. But uh, one of the issues that we, I wanted to talk about here was that through the exhibition and through the curatorial work that I'm doing around the exhibition, as Selima said, I'm not trying to just recover the material of the past. I'm not trying to put it in the vitrine. Actually, this has also been, this is, I think, what everybody's discussing here but also to, to activate it in the present and to make sense of it now. So what I did was use the space of the festival, which was very progressive and very emancipated and optimistic in a modern, it really kind of fitting in a modernist tradition happening in Iran, uh, and to use it in, in terms of understanding a global reorientation with a focus on inter-Asia connections and histories, as well as severances of those histories and connections. But also, again, a topic that has come up a lot here, to subvert the single reading from west to east into a more cyclical model, engaging in cultural negotiations from east to east, from east to west, from south to east, from south to south, constructing a panoramic exchange of global cultural discourse. I began to use the festival in order to examine the space of international modernity, a kind of modernity that was being experimented with in Iran at the time, across temporal and spatial divides and binaries of tradition and contemporary alien and self. This was very interesting because the festival, what it did, at the time of decolonization, uh, in, since it, was, it began in 1967, it really tapped into uh, a moment of, a kind of euphoric moment in the South, in the global South, of possibilities and dreams after the gigantic collapse of the old European empires, but also very much in line with the non-aligned movement. I don't know how many of the younger people here have heard about the non-aligned movement, but I'm quite shocked that most people that I speak to in my lecture at universities haven't heard about the non-aligned movement, which is, yeah, it resonates a lot with the kind of work I do, is how can we not know about the non-aligned movement? But the festival, I find, that I, I position it as very much in line with the non-aligned movement and the objectives of that kind of movement. I talk about modernity looking south and east, a topic again we've spoken about today, because the festival actually turned very much to Asian traditions, especially of, of South Asia, which is very much in line with quite a few intellectuals from around the world, not, not only from the third world or from the developing world or from the global south, but actually also from Europe and even from America, who did turn to Asian traditions in order to emancipate, for progress and, and, and emancipation. In fact, not everybody turned to cut and paste from the so-called center, but actually a lot of people at the time consciously turned to especially Asian traditions. So I picked this up in the project in order to uh, understand the moment we live in today. And I created something which was quite sensational for myself, but a lot of work to find this cyclicality and also verticality of time where we can sort of work against this horizontal notion of progress, where ideas recirculate and sometimes ideas are picked up from Japan and they are worked on in Central Asia and then they arrive in America and sometimes the other way around. And these these uh, moments of utopian ideas, transcendental ideas, solidarities, especially in the 20th century and especially in the second half of the 20th century are very, very interesting to look at how these dreams rose and also quite a lot of times disappeared and maybe even failed. So I put this historical timeline in the beginning and I looked at 
a moment in history where modernists from Europe and America, in order to liberate themselves, were looking to spiritualize and were looking to ritualize even. And for that, they were very much looking especially at Indian traditions. And nativists from around the world, whether they were from Uganda or Nigeria or Iran, were looking to modernize, but very much, very much uh, passionate about their native roots. So trying to make sense of something that is of their own, but actually they can employ and deploy as a means to progress. So the, the festival for me was a moment to kind of understand this, this space, this nexus, where these people could meet and could communicate. I also highlighted this moment where the avant-garde, the international avant-garde, which at this festival were mainly um, Eastern European, Central European, Western European, American, and also Japanese, picked up so much from especially Asian and African traditions and transmitted it the other way around, let's say from south to north or from, from east to west. There is a film, I don't know if it plays, it doesn't matter, I'll, I can, I'm going to talk about it tomorrow. Um, I've got some images that I'll go through very quickly to give you a sense of the space. This is America, an American company called Bed and Puppet Theater. This is uh, Jerzy Grotowski from Poland. This is uh, Nuri Espert from Spain who actually said that despite the restrictions in Iran uh, at the time, that coming from Franco Spain, Iran seemed like a breath of fresh air. So it's very interesting to remember that south of Europe was under dictatorships. Greece, Spain, Portugal were under military dictatorship at the time. Of course, Central and Eastern Europe um, were under the, behind the so-called Iron Curtain. It's a very important project that happened, a transnational project with actors coming from Cameroon, from Mali, from Japan, Iran, America, France. It's a performance by Stockhausen happening in the bazaar in Iran. I'll zip through these. This is Merce Cunningham, who also came with his company one year, and John Cage. A lot of Gamelan Balinese, quite a few of the Katar Balin from Kerala Kalamandalam company who came. And uh, the National Ballet of Senegal that left Senegal for the first time to be on an international stage. Shuji Terayama, very active at the time, Japanese. Teatrstu from uh, Poland and an Iranian production of uh, Alba Camus Caligula. Sorry, I'm zipping through. And then another project, which is very, very different, is called Recreating the Citadel. And the Citadel refers to the Citadel of shah e -Nur, the red light district of Tehran. I did an extensive research into its history, going back to the 1920s, the formation of the area, the streets, the shops, etc. There's a photograph which is from the date's unknown, but it's probably from the mid-60s. Uh, and very interesting material about the 50s and 60s and the emancipation of women in Iran, how that shifted attitudes towards prostitution, the red light district, and also the bigger questions of uh, citizenship, citizenship rights, through the work of the social work and the school of social work around the prostitutes, a lot of very, very interesting issues were raised in terms of, for example, they were pushing the parliament to pass laws to have, to give uh, old age pension uh, to the prostitutes and recognize them as citizens uh, living in the city. And also, of course, to, de to criminalize those who sell credit to the prostitutes as opposed to criminalize <coughs> prostitutes. I mean, very, very liberal and progressive attitudes. We're still trying to, to implement those things in, in places like the UK. Uh, I'm going to skip the film. Does it play? Um, I use film footages if I find them, like in this case. Doesn't play? Can you play? Can you press play? Okay, don't worry. Okay, don't worry. And the core of the exhibition, the core of the curatorial work, is formed, is, is, is based on a, a magnificent group of uh, 61 photographic works produced by a pioneer of documentary photography in Iran called Kabe Golestan. And I uh, exposed these 
for the first time in 2014 as a, as a complete set. They hadn't been seen since 1978 because effectively they're banned and there are many restrictions around showing them in Iran. And even in 19, sorry, 1978. And even in 1978, when they had been exhibited, this is just prior to the fall of the, of the monarchy in Iran and the establishment of the Islamic Republic, they were only shown for two weeks. Whereas it was meant to be for a month, but the intelligence and secret services found it too subversive. So there are some fantastic portraits, which I have now toured through several museums in Europe. It would be wonderful to be able to bring them here. They have been in Amsterdam at the Foam Museum of Photography, at the Musée d'Art Moderne uh, de la Ville de Paris in Paris, at uh, the Maxi Museum of 21st Century Art in Rome, at uh, Somerset House in London. And now 12 of these 61 portraits uh, are part of the permanent collection of the Musée d'Art Moderne in Paris, and 20 of them are placed at uh, Tate Modern. So the project has actually facilitated the first room ever at Tate Modern dedicated to an Iranian artist in their permanent collection. It's a subversive project, and it's very interesting that a, uh, an incredible institution, international, uh, like Tate, d chooses a project like this to open his first room to an Iranian artist. But also the same I would sort of add that um, when I started the, the work, I wasn't intending to focus and concentrate my curatorial work on areas that have, that have endured violence, like both of these projects. The, the first one, the festival, had a fatwa issued against it, a religious fatwa in 1977. And since then, all the documents have been destroyed, or they are kept out of access, uh, you know, away from access. So what I, what I did in, in terms of creating the exhibition is to put the puzzle together bit by bit by finding bits of information, clips of films in people's homes and basements, because the official, there is no official archive left. And of course, this space, I will come to it now, um, had a very grueling history, because two days prior to the arrival of Ayatollah Khomeini, the area was burnt down. And nobody took responsibility for the burning of the district, and nobody took count of the number of women who may have perished in the fire. And uh, the very, very interesting thing is that the photographers who gave me documents and photographs of the fire couldn't recall the date of the fire. They couldn't recall the exact date, but they also couldn't recall whether it was actually before the big date, 22nd of Batman, uh, I think the 12th of February, if I translate it into the um, Christian calendar, which is the fall of the monarchy and the takeover of Khomeini, or after, not even before or after. So the amnesia was extremely important for me and, and my project. And, and I found this newspaper after a, a while of doing research, which has on the right side, it says, vast preparations for the arrival of the imam, of the saint. And on the left, it says that the west and south of Tehran burn in flames of fire. And that fire is the fire of the red light district, but not just. Because in the, in the smaller script, it also says that the drinking houses, the taverns, the cabarets, the cinemas, and beer factories. Effectively, the, the entire district and the associated popular culture was destroyed in one day. And this is a photograph of uh, a charred body that um, the caption is by Abbas, the very well-known Iranian magnum photographer. And the caption says that the body is um, meant to be from the red light district, one of the women of the red light district. And then I recovered well, material about their execution of the women, which I included in the exhibition, and Amnesty International report. And now this is what the area looks like, because over the years, the area was not only burnt, and then it was destroyed, it was, it was flattened, and then it was turned into a park. So what I investigate through the curatorial work is not just the space of violence and the space of trauma, but also the, all the mechanisms that go into this. And in this case, this, the re-territorialization of that space is extremely important. The, the, the history is that first something is erased, but when something is erased and removed, it's always replaced with something. The void is filled with something. 
And here, of course, we have a very beautiful space of nature and lake, which looks healthy and is a place for, for enjoyment and for relaxation, which covers, hides, conceals even the scars of the, of the trauma. And this is, these are the documents I show with the portraits. And uh, this is how it's, uh, the, the Tate's actually only showing this amount of them. I, I'll talk about this more tomorrow. And this is another project, which is just three photographs I'm going to show you, which are documents of women demonstrating against the veil, the imposition of the veil in 1979 in Iran. Of course, today it's by law enforced. You cannot, even if you're Christian, Jewish, Armenian, you cannot walk in the streets. You cannot be in public unveiled. But these, these photographs are documents of the demonstrations that took place against that imposition and against the repeal of um, laws uh, which were pro-women. And I end here. Thank you. So I think um, in different ways, curators perhaps do come up against certain restrictions and they are put in a position of having to push boundaries, lines, um, and if they are to act as interpreters, if they are to act as excavators, uh, researchers who bring new knowledge uh, to audiences, um, there could possibly be uh, certain aspects which are unexpected. Um, I think in this city we know well about erasures, we know something about cultural amputations. Um, we have lost one of our major festivals which was amputated out of our um, calendar. It would have been happening right now. Uh, and um, of course there is the factor of children or kite flyers losing their lives. How many people die in um, police actions? We don't know. Um, possibly not less than people falling off roofs or uh, being injured by metal kite wire. Um, but also other kinds of gaps. And I do think somehow or the other, each one of you has indicated the curator acting as a person who does change the nature of people's knowledge and start sliding in uh, and filling in certain gaps, um, which brings us to the fact that I mean, I just like each one of you very quickly because we are now turning into the time of the audience's question, uh, to, to mention an instance where either there was a restriction or there was a gap that you felt aware of you were filling. Uh, in your curatorial work? Think of an instance. Um, when I made the BBC series, Treasures of the Indus, um, well, firstly, traveling around Pakistan with a film crew and making a film that was a positive film was um, a real eye-opener. And people were surprised enamored and welcome. And um, the, the Treasures of the Indus series has three episodes. Two of them were in India and one of them was in Pakistan. And it was the Pakistan episode that was the most revelatory for people because people have, as you know, um, these tropes and they, that occludes their vision and they just can't get beyond them, usually because of social media and news media. And, um, you know, I like to think of Pakistan as a new country with a very old history. And um, to try to bridge that gap in people's knowledge was a real privilege to be able to do. Melissa? Yes. Um, so actually, when I first arrived at the Hersham, we, for various reasons, didn't have a very set program in place. And so I had realized that we had had so few female artists in the program as major solo exhibitions. And so very early on, I talked to Shirin Nishat about doing a major survey exhibition. And we framed it in a very different way from 
all of her other shows, which were very much biographical. They were usually around gender and Islam and other issues. And what I did was to frame them around three important moments in Iranian history that were reference points in her work, whether it was the 79 revolution or the Green Revolution most recently. And I think that gave people, uh, in a way, a deeper understanding of her work as her reference points were mostly Iran rather than necessarily Islam or being a Muslim or the veil or some of these other kind of broader takeaways that people might have um, from a superficial view of her work. Um, that was right at the time when uh, the US was uh, discussing the kind of US-Iran nuclear proliferation agreement. So actually it was great timing because it gave a sense of that previous relationship, sometimes troubled between the US and Iran. Um, the other exhibition that I would describe as a, a challenging show that I was in, uh, involved in organizing um, was an exhibition around the uh, Cultural Revolution. So this was in many ways a dark period in Chinese uh, history. It was this 10 years at which there was an enormous amount of violence within the country and an attempt to modernize by the then political leader Mao Zedong. And it was, I think, an important contribution in terms of understanding visual culture in China today because most of the visual reference points for a certain generation of artists are all about the Cultural Revolution. There had never been done, there had never been a show of this period before um, in the West. And so it was a kind of show that really had to, I think, balance a very delicate line between those people who were victims during this period mm -hmm. and then the artists who were uh, heavily influenced by that iconography. Excuse me. Uh, I. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry, it's so confusing. We thought we had an audience question, an intervention, something I had said. Yeah. We have all ready for intervention. Bring it on, bring it on. You are dealing with a very fraught sort of portion of history. Uh, I mean, from the Sadak onwards, Iran has been in this sort of cyclical uh, period of time with, you know, and it's interesting that your excavations, your archaeological digs are looking at, um, as you said, a time of euphoria, which is a non aligned movement, when people, and you know, I'm ancient enough to remember it very much, when people felt genuinely that there was a possibility of there being non-aligned nations in the world, which could challenge, you know, the two blocks, which were deciding our fates. Uh, it's a very different time now. Are you finding any parallels um, to what is happening today when you are going into your things? Um, and you know, how do you think you're filling in some of those? How do you? How you uh, are you tapping into relevances? Um, no, I can't say I can find. I'm finding parallels, but I think the important thing for me is to uh, reintroduce within the gap the possibility of those dreams, in fact, and also to push back the um, horrible nationalisms that we deal with today and the horrible sectarianisms and, 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 and uh, paradigms that are mm, delivered to us as if they were always there, but it's not true that they were, they were always there. So remembering, filling the gap for me, remembering our own histories and reconciling our own experiences in a way that we can go forward because I find that by not actually knowing what you suffer, it's very, very difficult to, to, to have a way forward. So the filling the gap is very much about the knowledge of what we've been through and what we've had, and possibly sometimes what we've lost, and the, the, the ability to, to redream. I think in Pakistan we know very well what it is like to rewrite history many times over. And I'd like to throw this open. We have just about five to seven minutes to finish our session, but if we can have a question or anybody who'd like to, you know, uh, bring up something that they would like to touch upon um, or query, you're very welcome to jump in at this moment. Even from the other hall. Well, it's a good excuse for all of you to come to the sessions tomorrow. 
Uh, Melissa will not be here, but Shona will be uh, in a session tomorrow, and so with Vari, where there will be greater details about you know, some of their um, focuses and some of their interests. I think that because uh, it's been an enormous privilege to have three curators on this panel, um, and that is very rare for us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.